<laughs> What's up world? It's your boss International Zo. I'm here once again in Rio de Janeiro. We're right here on Copacabana Beach. I'm with I would say the legendary John Thompson. <laughs> um, how did I uh, become familiar with this? The gentleman, <coughs> excuse me, from <coughs> initially, uh, initially I saw him in the uh, frustrated documentary. And then um, upon visiting a few times, I thought it would be to my benefit as a person who interviews and tries to share and disseminate information to meet him speak with him and understand his uh, history and knowledge on Rio de Janeiro. Especially being that there's a new generational push of American black men coming here to Rio de Janeiro. We spoke, this is not our first interview, and um, each time I come, I either bump into him or call him, so, you know, to, to, to his credit, he stayed on top of me while I was here this time. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to speak again. I think there's a few things that um, maybe I would like to, questions that I would like to ask. And I think the uh, channel has grown and some people may not have seen the other uh, interviews. So if you want to know all the details and the, all the history, you can look at some of the other videos, which I'll uh, put a link in this video too. But now we're in 2022, and um, like I said, I discovered him, not discovered him, but came to know him from the frustrated one, and then you know two, and then some of you know that there's a frustrated three out now. So quickly, we'll just run through some simple questions to get you guys up to speed with uh, Mr. John Thompson. Um, not to be all in your business, but I think it holds some significancy to ask you your age at this time. I'm 80 years old. 80 years old. God bless you, brother. God bless you. I, I woke one day to be 80 and healthy like yourself. You're looking good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and from our last conversation, you know, some people can be 80 and not have all their mental faculties and mobility, and um, you're blessed to have everything. Um, upon speaking with you the last time, I was impressed by your knowledge of history, your intelligence, and your viewpoints, which I agree with a lot of it. Your, I don't want to say necessarily pro-black, pro but somewhere in that vein, you know, people could use a different language to express that, but um, I find that you have, um, in my opinion, a love for your people, black people, and a concern. So, um, when did you first come to Rio and why? I first came to Rio in 1987, and one reason why, maybe maybe trivial to some people, uh, I came here on a vacation, I left my Rolls Royce in a garage, and someone broke in the garage and put the engine in the trunk. I was so upset over that, I just had got promoted to a deputy warden. I was in, in, in rank for about three months, and I said, the heck with it, I'm leaving. I only had three months to go to finish 20 years in the department, and I left. Right, and that's the police department, you were? I was the Department of Correction. Department of Correction. I was a deputy warden in the Deputy warden Rikers in Rikers Island. Rikers Island. Yeah. Any New Yorkers or, I mean, even people who are familiar with hip hop culture have heard of Rikers Island. It's infamous with uh, crime in New York City and violence and I think it takes a special type of individual to um, work there, um, retire from there, and um, you know, keep their sanity. 
But, you know, real, in reality, I, what I was so upset about, the mere fact that, like I said before, I was decorated a hero, and in my tenure in the United States, whatever, uh, I saved three lives over the years, and I felt I was, I don't know, I shouldn't have felt that way. I felt I was just, uh, you know, traitors or something I don't, uh -huh. against me. I don't know. It's just, well, you know. It was a mental thing. <laughs> they say jealousy is a mother. You know that. Mm-hmm. Jealousy is a mother, you know. You got a Rolls Royce, you work in corrections. <laughs> Add on properties in yeah, California, you own, yeah, you, New York. A, a, successful, a <laughs> successful man, um, you know. I just felt upset. Yeah. I don't know. So, you came here to celebrate your status, maybe, and vacation. Yeah, well, I came here on vacation and, right. and uh, in 85, right. because I was going back and forth to Jamaica and the islands, right. and I just didn't like the way I was being treated, you know, especially when you get off the plane, they give all the roads and everything, they act like you're, you're not there. Right. And I just felt that I needed a change, mm -hmm. and a brother in, Brook in Brooklyn had owned a club uh, right down the block from Rasmus High School, uh, and said, John, why don't you go to Brazil? And that's when I came to visit. Right. And how long did you stay on the first visit? I stayed about 10 days. 10 days. It was Ipanema. I stayed, I believe it was the Ipanema Inn. Uh -huh. Not far from where Jean Jobin wrote that girl from Ipanema. Right. In yeah. that area. The famous song. So what was your first impressions, being that you had been to the Caribbean a few times and some other places? This was different. This is South America. This is uh, Portuguese, not even Spanish or Creole. And I only spoke English at yeah. that time. What was that like then? I mean, because uh, in this day and age, you know, I'm sure there are a lot more uh, Brazilians who speak English, who, who are familiar with pop culture, hip hop culture, and, and what goes on. But in 85, I could imagine that might have been difficult to navigate. They were extremely uh, friendly and very open and everything and and, and it was I, I was taken back right from the way they treated me what was the most culture shocking thing maybe to you in 85 when you first came here like what what impressed you the most was it the beach was it the women was it the music was it the food what was it i, I would say the music food uh the women you know, women, women, pretty all over the world, mm -hmm. whatever. I would, at that period of time now, we had some really gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful women in New York. I was a promoter. Right. I promoted for almost 30 years in New York. Right. Okay, so uh, my parties and everything, and, they, and I got beautiful support. My biggest supporters in Brooklyn were the women. Right. Yeah, well, women, the women. Word travels fast with women. <laughs> <laughs> we to, I, I arranged bus ride to the mm -hmm. Teddy Pendergraph show and what have you. Right. And, and, and like I say, my supporters were the women. Right. I had to try to find enough guys because there was always a bunch of and beautiful women. I gave fashion shows and what have you right. in New York. So being that you was already a player from the Himalaya, <laughs> uh, the women didn't take you off guard so much. You not, were accustomed not, to seeing beautiful at women. All. Not at that's all. That's good. I, that's a perspective that I haven't heard. People often ask me, uh, where, where, where is the most beautiful woman? Where is the most beautiful woman? And I'll usually say, there are beautiful women all over, everywhere. I, I've, I haven't been a place on this earth that I haven't seen loads of beautiful women. But here's another thing you don't remember. You probably wasn't born then. Mm -hmm. Black women in the United States many, many years ago were number one almost in the world in wow. beauty. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you look at some of my pictures I put on face put on Facebook. Mm -hmm. They were gorgeous. They still are. They still are. <laughs> still are. Many are still uh, guys are. Guys, be talking. But you know the the the, the uh, lifestyle, yeah. eating style, what yeah. have you, and the food itself, yeah. and the chemicals that put in the food, changed made a lot of changes. I understand that. I understand. Yeah. That. Okay, so in '85 you first came here. After that, how often did you return? And when did you go from coming here to visit a vacation to doing business here? 
When did that happen? Okay, I, off that return, after I got here my, on my first trip, that was carnival. See, wow. I've been here for 37 consecutive carnival. I'm always in Rio for yeah. carnival. 37 right. already, 37 years. Wow. And uh, <laughs> what inspired me, uh, most of the people, the way they treated me. And then after, I say uh, every three months, whenever I got a chance to get on a plane, I was in Rio. Three months. And, and at that time, you had a, a pro, uh, something set up with companies, and you, you you come down as a courier, and you can and well, they charge maybe two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars round trip as a carrier. What does that mean, a carrier? Okay, what uh, companies? Uh, send articles and, and, and whatever to Brazil, right. supply to Brazil, and they had an agency in New York that you you go there and they uh, and you sign up to be uh, represent them, represent that agency. So uh -huh. when that when the cargo arrive in uh, Brazil, you have to go and make sure that, that all the cargo got here oh, safe okay. and sound. So you found a way to make it more economical for yourself. Right. That stopped. After the World Trade, oh. the comp those companies closed down after the World Trade. Well, that was a long run then. Oh, man, and I took advantage of it. <laughs> okay, so when did you decide that you want to do business here, and what was the business? It was probably around 1987. Uh, okay. I wanted to do business because I found that uh, a lot of racism here, too, okay. uh, like the United States. Right. And I wanted to set up a business where I can uh, entertain the blacks, who coming down for rent apartments? Right. Goes difficult. A, a lot of time, you know, that st stereotype right. from the U.S. is here in Brazil too. Right. So many times, uh, blacks couldn't find apartment. They tell them it's not available. Right. So I wanted to establish, establish a relationship with the owners to be able to rent to uh, black constituents, right. and that was my reason. So this is early, way before Airbnb, because I would assume. At that time, most people were, had to, their only option was staying in a hotel if they couldn't get an apartment or had a relationship to get to an apartment. Exactly. So you were the li liaison between the brothers coming here and putting them in apartments instead of hotels. Exactly. Which is probably more affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So, and what else did you do besides that? Was there anything else that maybe you didn't consider business that you did along with? Finding places for people's brothers to stay when they came down. Well, I started having parties, giving parties, parties right? To tours and parties, and mm -hmm. and I gave a lot of parties. Right. So I would. Was there a certain season that that the brothers would come down here, or did you also influence them coming here, the discovering? This oh yeah, place? Well, I influenced them to come in here, uh -huh. and I started a newsletter. Okay. Okay. Uh, and 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 my news. And I had a. We had a. I had a list. Uh, at one point, my list had about a uh, 200, 300 wow. people on my list, mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, and I worked on my newsletter. I, my, I opened, a, I had a site. At one point, I had 700 apartments on my site. 700 apartments. 700. I'll show you a copy of it one day. Jesus, uh -huh. 700 apartments. I can't even fathom that. To have a relation, those were relationships because oh. it wasn't the time of social media or anything so you had to call the owners speak to the owners earn the trust of the but owners. many owners found found you as well found me as well mm -hmm. and i was renting in uh, baja ipanema copacabana mm -hmm. lebron mm -hmm. up, you know the state of rio de janeiro wherever i person right. wanted to so, and from what time did you do that from 87 until when 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 was the decline of that business well and well, how did that I opened happen? my own office up here. Okay. I was probably the first black uh, and American. In Copacabana? To, to, yeah, to have you had a storefront. I had an office, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. On the Jean Marie. Okay. Not far from uh, the Help Disco. Right. Okay. Which was very famous in the Very its time. famous. And, and, you know, your list grew from the mere fact that uh, Help Disco drew perfect people from all over the world. Right. I had white clients in England. Wow. Okay, and, and Europe and what have you. So I had clients all over the based all over the world then. Right. How long did it take you to learn the language? Uh <laughs> that's a that's a good one. You know, I'm again still learning. <laughs> yeah of course. We're always still learning. I say I say about uh, some a few years. I I 
enroll in uh, school classes in Manhattan. That's good. And, really? And, yeah. would, okay. Interesting. I'm going to have to do the same because I've been trying those apps and they really haven't been helping me. So from its inception around 87, when did that kind of stop? Like what year and why did it stop? And uh, well, was that a big part of your income or was it like um, a hobby turn business? Like, was it just additional income or was it your main source of business for a while? It was, it was basically, it was a business. I didn't depend on it. You know, well, being an entrepreneur and a business And retired. Already. And, and I had properties here and the properties there, right. which I sold. But I didn't depend on it because I had a good pension and right. social security and what have you. Right. So just having a business it, it was, mind. Is, my thing was really to really help the brothers and sisters coming right. out. Right. Okay, right. and and as I spoke to you before, there was a lot of problems too with people getting yeah. arrested and problems with the young ladies and da 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 da. Right. And this I got involved with with my buddy, the police inspector, and and at, at one point I I posted on Facebook, and Internal Affairs called him and said, "What were you guys doing?" Wow. <laughs> and matter of fact, as I noted, his mother just passed away. And that's another thing. I met her, I'd say, around 80, no, 87 or 90. And, and they treated me like part of the family. Right. And they were Caucasian. Right. They treated me like part of the family. Right. I would go to, I went to the house one day, she said, John, you look tired. Why don't you go back in the room there and take a nap or something? Right. And, and these things were so, in, so beautiful mm -hmm. to me that I truly fell in love. My goddaughter, who's an attorney now, I met her, she was five years old, right? And I enrolled her in a class here around six or seven. And now she's an attorney for uh, 20 years, an attorney, and she's 40 years old now. Wow, wow. Okay, so when did the business of renting apartments, how did that end? And what was well, the cause of it? Is it something that just died out over time, or was there some other reason? Well, one of the main factors, were I had a competitor from, from America. I wouldn't name any names. An American competitor? Yeah, a Caucasian. Okay. okay. And, and uh, I would say my lifestyle was different than his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because being law enforcement by retired, I didn't deal with certain things that contrary to the law right and I don't know if that was the reason but uh, I would I I started my business to attract my brothers because it was difficult for them to find apartments right but for whatever reason they drifted away okay that lack of unity and not only that some of the brothers who really helped me one being the doc, the late doctor uh, Robert Beals, number one dye doctor in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Hamp Jackson, number one orthopedic surgeon. After their Dr. Beals passing, that's when really things changed because he was my the backbone to a lot of things I did. Right, right. And it's and that ended around what year was that? When kind of oh, well, I had planned a boat ride, and it, which was a successful boat ride. I think I sent you a video, mm -hmm. and that was uh, November 2000, and I think it's 2004. 2004. He was killed in a car accident mm -hmm. that year, 2004, and called me six hours before his death, before he had the accident. Mm -hmm. And I was tired, and I said, Doc, I'm really tired, I can't talk. He said, oh, you don't want to talk to me, brother. I said, no, brother, you know I love to talk to you. And, and says, so okay, well, I'll call you in the morning, and I got a call 6 o'clock in the, that morning that he was killed in the car accident. Right. So you you kind of operated your business close to 12 to 15 years. Right, but his back, his, his uh, brother, network. brotherhood, network and everything, and, and the respect that we all had for him right. was basically one of the backbones to my, drive the business. to my business. And we were like brothers. Right. Okay, so then there was a time a new era came in, and we're going to talk about Charles Tyler. He, through social media, kind of ushered in a new era of black men visiting 
<laughs> him literally promoting black men in America to come here to Rio de Janeiro. Um, how did you meet him? And uh, what did he mean to you? And what do you mean to him? Okay, well, I met Charles Tyler via, he called me up, a conversation on the phone, and introduced himself to me. And uh, we had a nice conversation. Then we, he said, well, why don't we get together, something like that. And that's how we started. So we were working together. About what year was this? Oh, my God, that was around the 13 or 15, something like that. You know? 2015, 2015. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's how we started. So we uh, got together, we were giving parties and what have you. I took care of all the parties. I paid the party for everything. And basically, what he was doing was bringing me to clients, and I gave him a commission from the client. So did you, you do parties in bars, clubs, or boat rides, or beach uh, parties? Like, what was it? Mostly beach parties. Beach parties, okay. Beach parties. And then we then we team up together for the, for the day of the holiday, the black holiday, the day of Zumbi, mm -hmm. taking groups to uh, some of the black events and to the monument of Zumbi. And that's how it grew from that point on. Right. We had a good, great, great, great relationship. Right. And you told me something about his death and, and uh, the conversation you had with his father. Uh, tell us about that. Well, eventually, uh, other people start influencing him. And I, and I believe that maybe Charles is having some difficulties I mean, financially also. And um, we, uh, and some of the events, I, I was surprised that he had another event at the same time. Okay, and I asked him about it. And, and brushed it off but anyway we were still friends and before his death uh, we sit we were in a restaurant here uh, uh, at that time named Manshiki and we talked about all of these things As a matter of fact I think we closed the restaurant down that night uh -huh. talking and, and, that deep in the, in the conversation yeah, yeah and I told him well look tell the other competitor that way let's work together he said well John but he don't want to work with you I said okay no problem but that was the last, basically the last conversation we had. And and the day uh, that he became, he went into, uh, he was very upset, you know, ill and everything. Uh, when he had, he was involved in a car accident on his first arrival, and I took him to the hospital and everything, okay? And and the day that he was really feeling, I think about five o'clock in the morning, he called Raphael, one of the other brothers, he said, call John, he wanted to get in touch with me. Okay, that one of the few nights that I turned my phone off, because I used to keep my phone off on all night long. Right. And uh, that next morning I heard that he had gone in a coma. Right. Yeah. And once that happened, um, what other information do you have? Like, how did they, how did his family handle it? How did they get him home? Like, do you know what? Well, uh, they, I think they were doing collections and everything, money to get him home and what happened. And the lies came about, they said, oh, John didn't contribute, I didn't do this and I do that. I didn't do that. And I sent his sister a check, okay, towards the funeral and everything. And, uh, well, I surprised everybody because I, showed up at the funeral. Uh, one of my brothers from uh, home, retired Homeland Security picked me up at the airport and I went to the funeral. And that's when Raphael introduced me to his father. His father shared with me uh, his, his love, emotion, whatever for me. He said, John, you was his idol. He worshipped you. He talked about you all the time. I was I was surprised. I was taken back. Right. And, and, uh, and that was it. But the new group took over. They didn't. They threw me out of the group. I don't know why. Then after Al Grease took over, I still didn't get back in the group. So I don't know why. But right. apparently they have their own agenda. Right. Well, you were you were in the uh, frustrated documentary one, and I. It appeared that you had the most uh, seniority on Rio from the little part that you were in. And you had a great observation on the article that was in the Ebony magazine. I was looking at the article this morning. Right. So even after that, so how do you, you know, 
for you not to be involved anymore is, is you know, kind of strange, you know? And Al Grease actually helped me reach you when I wanted to reach you to interview you. Well, you know, I don't find it strange as I wrote to you because of the systematic brainwashing. We are systematically brainwashed and, and most of our people don't know their history. If they knew their history, they wouldn't be as brainwashed as they are. The miseducation of Carter G. Wilson, the miseducation of the Negro. Right. And I think a lot of things could be settled just on a man-to-man -man conversation. To sit down and talk it. We got them. You know, just, I think a lot of, when there's no communication, there could be a lot of misunderstanding. You know, and I think the fact that we don't sit down and talk and voice our opinions, which is just an opinion until you get the facts. Well, I was always available to sit down and talk, as I am right now. Right. Okay, right. now when you say that longevity, I think I'm the only one alive now who's been back and forth to this country in the last 37 years. All the rest right. of my friends, good friends, they've all passed away. Right. I'm the, I'm the lone wolf right now. Right. And I think um, more light should be shed, on, shed upon that. You know, there's a whole new era of young guys here and content creators and, you know, I think they're overlooking that. Well, one other thing they will look to, and I think I'm the only one, I, was, I could say that saved three brothers' lives, right? Three brothers' lives were decorated as a hero by Mayor Koch and received uh, acknowledgement from the borough president, Howard Golden, at that time. Okay, but three brothers' lives over the years. You would think a person that saved three brothers' lives would get more respect than what's happening to what happened to me. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a, a generational gap of people having respect for their elders. Well, I don't know if there's a generational gap, just part of the the Negro mindset of hating each, hating them, self hate, and loving the oppressor. Yeah, That's what the brother Malcolm talk about, and many of the other brothers. It's more of erosion now, though. You know, like. Certain errors were still raised, like, I was still raised to respect my elders. You know what I mean? And I think that just diminished over time. Yes. You know what I mean? Oh, so, for sure. So, for sure. yeah. And, um, man. You, you remind me, when I was growing up in Brooklyn, Bedside, mm -hmm. called it Do or Die, yeah. Tompkins Park. But there's one thing about, like, you had gangs all over the place. And as a <laughs> your gang member, you with your parents, you stick your hand up in the other gang, you know, and you get that respect. Right. Now, if you're by yourself, hell, they might kill you. Right, right. But the thing about it is that the elder, all the elderly people, you call them uh, you, Mr. 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 Mrs. Right. You more respect. Now you don't have that respect. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge difference. But we're being, if you look at the pol politics in the United States right now and the white supremacy, you would think that we should be united and getting together and getting our votes together, whatever. But we are so divided now at a most critical time in our history. No, which brings me to a question I want to ask you. There's a big movement going on on social media. I mean, from every angle of American men, especially, well, well, let's just talk about the American black men. Really like downing our women and telling every, all, all the black men to get their passport and go get these women overseas. You know, you being an a, 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 a older statesman, been here more than anybody. How do you feel about, I mean, because me, I feel like in my opinion, I understand that there is a disconnect between black men and black women in America. Yeah, that's, that's uh, bullshit. Thank you. And, and so that's his answer towards but, but look here. But, women are so yeah, much more feminine. Right now, now women are much more feminine overseas and get your passport. It's your freedom papers. It's your freedom papers to travel the world and explore. It's not your freedom papers to say, 
Forget about the women in America. Forget about the aggressive women in America, the masculine women in America, the feminine women. There are great women and bad women everywhere. Everywhere. And this is this is an elder who's been here, coming back and forth here for over 30 years, and he's like, what did you just say? I said it's bullshit. Women's or women's. Or, sometime with the Brazilian, I, I, I pulled my hair. I said, God damn, what world is she in, and what world am I in? Exactly. And having eight grandchildren, I think about most of them are women, right. and they're so beautiful. I looked at a post the other day, three of my granddaughters, I said, damn, they're looking good right. on, on Facebook. And they're women, and they're beautiful people. Right. Man. They're beautiful people. They're, women's are women's all over the right. world. And, I, and when I was my last trip in New York, right, I mean in the state, uh -huh. just recently, oh, man, I was at, at the, uh, I went to the, the little select room in, uh, in uh, at, at Delta, what Delta? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, Delta yeah, yeah. Select. And they were so kind. I was, I was getting so many people to want to come to Brazil. Mostly women. Oh, John, what about that? Da, 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 da. Introduced mm -hmm. myself. Went to the post office. Everybody in the post office. I was giving out flyers. Everybody just excited, man. Right. Giving me their phone number and everything, man. No, women are women all over the world. Thank you. And beautiful. All of them. And there's way more similarities than differences. Thank you. I think the reason why guys might come to these countries and think that it's better or sweeter because you don't sp speak the language yet is she can't cuss you out the way she wants to. <laughs> we know how to, well, we know how to come now. We don't have to go into that. Yeah, we but to... I'm just saying the reason why they might not have hit ahead uh -huh. with them yet because they don't communicate on that level with them yet. And they're poor. Yeah. And there's a little humility because of poverty and poverty. The thinking. It's no difference than maybe how black people would give white people respect back in the days because they think that you don't want to ruffle their feathers because they might be able to help you. Right. You right. know, that kind of similar thing. But look at these. I'm so excited now. You look at these ch children now, even in the United States and Brazil, they are so intelligent yeah. at, at such a young age. Hell, when I was growing up, my aunt, we had, at six years old, I was working. Six and seven years old. And we have to bring the money home to my aunt, and she distributed it. Right. At six and seven years old. In 1949 or whatever, I was selling uh, rubber bands to the MPs uh, in Fort Jackson and the newspaper, the Columbia News. Right. Okay? So I worked back all my life. Right. Okay. But I guess that kept the family closer, knowing that we're all going to bring the resources together. But she was a general. Oh, yeah. Well, Sometimes you got to have law and order. But <laughs> well, she damn sure got law and order. It was law and order, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so last question is, in your opinion, you know, you've been coming here over 30 years. How has Rio changed in that time frame? And is it for better, for worse, or neither? Well, now, I guess politically, uh, I'm seeing a little surge, say, in, uh, in racism. Okay. Uh, for, and, and the same ignorance with, with uh, black Americans, with black Brazilians, too. To give you an example now, I'm 80 years old a lot of time. I'm waiting on the bus, and it's that black bus driver that passed my ass up all the time. Okay? <laughs> a lot of times, the white bus driver stopped for me. We taught to hate your own. You know how that is. Yeah, man. It's, it's something else, man. So, mm. and, and, you know, a lot of people don't think I'm 80, of course. Uh, well, and then I have to show my ID and all that good stuff. But on the subway system, beautiful. Matter of fact, if, I think if you're 65, even if you show your passport, guys been showing their passport, and they still go and get them free, right. you know. And they have the, during rush hour, they have the carts for women, so they're not harassed by men. I think that's unique in itself that they actually. Oh yeah, you know, they put still have. Those, I didn't know. Yeah, because, well, yeah. I'm not. Most of the time, you know, I'm not the here doing yeah, rush but hour. Yeah, they still have. It. Yeah. Oh yeah, they still yeah, have. Yeah, it? yeah. Oh yeah. So, one more thing I want to say. You do events for the youth here in Brazil. A charity. Charity. Um, tell us about the charity, and if someone maybe wanted to help or donate. How could they go about that? Okay, well, the chair, I started the first charity around, around 1987. My son, you and I, my son and I, we started. And now, then after that, we started a charity with 
Captain Davis uh, and, and Jimmy and several and a few other people at the beginning. Uh, Brazil All You Need Charity. And what we do in, in the favela of Vigigal, we just have a church that we help them and work with the kids, take them on tours and what have you. And right now we're trying to set up something for adults to get uh, computer uh, 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 classes and everything. Pay with through uh, our one of our major donors, uh, Mr. Lewis Henry from the McDonald Corporation through Southern Universities. That's what we're working on now. And, it's, and uh, to donate, uh, I'll give you the information because okay, I'll put it in the yeah, details. Okay. Right. And Captain Davis was Arch Davis' nephew, is our treasurer. A good brother. He's just retired from Delta not too long ago. And now he's an uh, instructor. He teaches pilots in Delta also. So he still works for Delta, but he okay. retired. And tell us about your shirt. The last thing is tell us about ah, your shirt. The Who shirt, is that and what does that mean? That's what is that? Zumbi. Zumbi. Zumbi, he was leader of the Palmares. And they fought the Portuguese for, uh, you know, for freedom. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was assassinated in uh, 1695. Oh, six, no, 1655 he was born. 16, six, 1695 he was assassinated. He was probably one of the greatest freedom fighters in the world, black freedom fighter in the world. You see his image in Samba Alley and certain places around Rio. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But never got the credit. He goes, he fought and he killed the uh, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, yeah, for freedom. And eventually they caught him and, they, and he was uh, uh, beheaded, you know, but he was a great person. And we celebrate his, his memory every year, November the 20th. November the 20th. Uh -huh. So I'm looking forward, if anybody's listening, to come down and celebrate the legacy of Zumbi. What do you do in the celebration? Well, doing? we go to the Monument of Zumbi. Okay. It's a, a holiday in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Right. And then after the monument, we go to events uh, honoring uh, Zumbi and celebrating his legacy. Right. All day events. Using the black township, Madureira, which is predominantly black. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we do. One of the most greatest events that we have in Rio yeah, de Janeiro. Yeah. Well, thank you, as always. It's always a pleasure. Hey, my pleasure, brother. <laughs> All right. We're signing out. Peace. Hey, man. Uh, thank you. Hey. Subscribe, snitches.